You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Last week, we were talking with Rob Fitzpatrick about Michiru Ayoama, the uh, Japanese ambient musician. For the benefit of anybody who didn't hear it, the thing that made Michiru, Michiru Ayoama exceptional is he puts out a new LP record every day. Every day, 20 minutes, 20 seconds. <laughs> 20 minutes, 20 minutes. tracks, minutes. always the same length, same number of tracks. And he's Absolutely. done it since the 31st of December 2021. And, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, what an admirable thing this is to be what a, apparently is the hardest working man in the music business. Do you, do you think? I can't think of anybody. You, well, yeah, because he works on it for, I can't remember how many hours a day it was. It takes him about six or seven hours a day, every day, seven days a week. So that is commitment, isn't it? That's dedication. Whereas, and it's, it's quite interesting to contrast that. Do you know, I, I worked out, I was thinking about this. And do, you know, do you know who are the least hardworking men in music business, and they are mainly men, because I've worked it out, Mark. Cool. I know the answer to this. The, hard, the least hardworking men in the music business, and here is mainly a historical thing. Back in the 70s and the 80s, when albums were made in the old-fashioned way, yeah? Yeah. Least hardworking man in the show business, in, in, in music, would be somebody like, to pluck a name from the ether, Nick Mason of Pink Floyd. Yes? Because when Pink Floyd was making a record, which would take six months, he would go in there, he would lay down the rhythm tracks, and then there would be effectively nothing nothing for him to do for months. For months at all. That's right. Months at <laughs> all. Sit the in the corner of... and do the crossword. Or just not be there. Oh, just not be there. And there are cases of this. Um, when Fleetwood Mac made Tusk, which took years, didn't it? Well, years they started from, off by building their own studio, didn't they? They did. They yeah. built their own studio. And um, the, the person who did least there in terms of hours put in was um, uh, John McVie. Because he would do the bass parts and then he would literally not just leave the studio, Mark, not just leave Los Angeles, Mark, he would get on his yacht That's right, and he would abroad. Go sail somewhere right. out into the middle of the Pacific. Yeah. So if you want him back, matey, you're going to have to wait till he comes back, you know? Yeah. Um, so those people, that's my contention. I'm, I'm not knocking them. They're wonderful musicians, and, and I'm sure their parts were hugely important. But they weren't very, they weren't very um, time. You know, they didn't use a lot of time. Uh, so they were the least work, hardworking uh, men. Whereas at the other world. other end of the scale, Frank Zappa, sixty-two albums, wasn't it, in his lifetime? <laughs> sixty-two albums, I think. One hundred and twenty-seven there are now. And Prince, I think, made twenty-nine albums in something like thirty years. I mean, that is ridiculous. Isn't it? Shall I tell you what's ridiculous? Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, okay? You've probably heard of him. How many operas, Mark? How many operas? Have a guess. Well, you would have started at the age of about seven, so I, I kind of know. I'm guessing. Uh, 23. 20? 23. 23. 23 operas. How many symphonies? 41. My God. 41. How many piano concertos? 27. No. The violin concertos, a mere five. No end of string quartets, quintets, and endless church music. Just endless. And what's the amazing thing about Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart? Is he did all that, and he was dead at 35. 35. Which you might think is as a result of the yeah. extraordinary... Extraordinary hard work. Burning the candle at both ends. <laughs> Absolutely. Applying a blowtorch to the middle. Applying a blowtorch yeah, to yeah. the middle. Well, it's... I hear you're Amadeus Mozart, Wolfgang, <laughs> and I raise you Enid Blind. Oh, All right, go on. 762 books. <laughs> Slim That's volumes, but yeah. 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 Slim yeah. volumes. Alexander, uh, Alexander Dumas, 277 books. P.G. Woodhouse, a piffling 127. <laughs> Stephen King, 60. 
Isaac Asimov, 50. This is a brilliant, it's someone I'd never actually heard of. You will have heard of her. Kathleen Mary Lindsay. No, I haven't. No. She wrote under 11 pseudonyms. Mary Faulkner, Margaret Cameron, etc. Et she wrote 904 books. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? Isn't it? So, Georges Simon, uh, the Belgian writer, probably best known for inventing the character Maigret, uh, was so productive that in the 20s, or maybe the 30s, he had an affair uh, with Josephine Baker, <laughs> the kind of <laughs> extraordinary, glamorous showgirl figure of, uh, you know, of uh, trendy Paris in the 1930s. And uh, he eventually had to break off the affair with her because she was getting in the way of his of his work rate. And he meant... Which was a one, novel a month, wasn't it, or something? One year, one year, while he was in a, having an affair with Joseph Ian Baker, he produced a mere 12 books that year. And he thought, this can't go on. <laughs> this can't go on. Sorry, darling, you're going to have to go. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to get on with the work. Absolutely. Is, Josephine Baker, that's uh, surely in itself a full-time job, having an affair you would, have you would thought, imagine. You would have thought. I give you, have you got another one? I've got another one here. I've Mike, got. Go on. Oh, well, no, I was going to say Barbara Cartland, I suppose. Oh, right, uh, go on. Barbara Cartland wrote 23 novels a year, and in total, 723. I mean, that is ludicrous, isn't it? 23. So that's two a month. She's writing a novel every fortnight. I give you Michael Curtiz, film director, Hungarian by yeah. birth. So did his early work in Hungary and Paris. And so he'd already directed 64 films in Europe when he came to Hollywood at the age of 39. Okay, at which point you, you thought he might slacken off a bit. No, he did a further 102 in Hollywood. Okay, and among these... He, 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 Curtis could do anything. He could do westerns, he could do romance, he could costume dramas, he could do comedy, he could do love story. Nothing he can do. Horror, he could do absolutely anything. And so he did lots of things you might remember. You know, he did the Charge of the Light Brigade. He oh, did yeah. The Adventures of Robin Hood. Was that the one with, with, uh, with Terence Stamp? Yeah. It was. No, 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 no. That's like years later. It's Tony yeah, yeah. Richardson. That's like 40 years later. Oh, no, uh, sorry, it's much earlier. Yeah. 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 And you know, but he did the Avengers of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn, where Errol Flynn wins the archery contest by splitting the arrow of the previous contestant. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Um, he did Angels with Dirty Faces in 1938, where Jimmy Cagney plays Rocky Sullivan, the gangster. Yes, whose opening line is "Morning, gentlemen, nice day for murder." <laughs> he did. He did Casablanca in 1942. You know, yeah. Casablanca. He did uh, Mildred Pierce in 1945 with Joan Crawford. I was watching the trailer. It goes, Mildred, a name gasped in the night, the one last word of a dying man. He did White Christmas. That's Mildred. He, he did White <laughs> Christmas. Yeah. He did White Christmas in 1954, where you get Rosemary Clooney and Vera Ellen singing, Lord, help the mister that comes between me and my me sister. Me and my sister. What a great book. What a great film. The gal that comes between me and my man. That's right. And one of, the, one of the last films he made in 1958, I think he stopped in 62, one of the last films he made is the, is the best Elvis Presley film and also Elvis Presley's favourite of his films, which is, of course, King Creole. So he did all that. Amazing. And also, because he's English, was legendarily rather broken and strange. Yeah. He also provided the title for the greatest collection of Hollywood nostalgia and the greatest Hollywood memoir ever written, which is David Niven. Who oh, also bring on the Empty Horses. Bring on the Empty Horses. Yes. Which, which is, is a, a line, fantastic line, isn't it? Is a line he barked through, probably through a megaphone yeah. on set of The Charge of the Light Brigade. Bring on the Empty Horses. That's However, right. I don't know how Hungarian accent goes. So I give you the hardest working man in show business of any kind, Michael Curtis. That's my that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. 
The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. Out on Netflix, I think very recently, was a film which actually you were involved with in various capacities, which was the um, Anton Corbijn film uh, called Squaring the Circle, the story of hypnosis. Um, Poe Powell and Storm Thorgerson, who designed all those fantastic sleeves, wings and 10cc and the Floyd XTC, trees, Led Zeppelin, etc. Um, really good, quite a great title too, Squaring the Circle. It's a lovely idea, isn't it? Creating the, 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 the 12 inch square cover that goes around the circular record. Yeah. And it's, I thought, it, I thought this is a really good film. It's well worth seeing. It's brilliant. And they are an amazing story because you're going back to a world where you cannot believe the amount of money that was spent on album sleeves. And also album sleeves were so significant, weren't they? Because you sat there and you listened to the record and you often did so while studying that sleeve. And, you know, it advanced massively from the Pet Sounds sleeve of five blokes in a petting zoo to the point where sleeves indicated that rock music had depth and spirituality and didn't it? And, and limitless Im- imaginative potential. And, uh, there's, the, it tells the story of all sorts of sleeves. One of them is the Houses of the Holy uh, story, which is extraordinary, isn't it? The, the Led Zeppelin bomb, where they, <laughs> they, they decide to go and shoot. They're going to shoot in Peru. And then they decide instead to do it at the Giant's Causeway. They have to go out to the Giant's Causeway, shoot for 10 consecutive days, shooting in black and white early in the morning and late in the evening because they think the light's going to be right. And even then with the two little naked children, which you, again, couldn't really do now. <laughs> I mean... And then the whole thing was eventually put together as a collage and, and colour tinted. So the amount of work. And there's one brilliant line that sums it all up. I think, uh, I think it's when he's talking about 10cc. One of them said, I need a sheep, a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist coach, a vet and a ticket to Hawaii. Yeah. And this, the idea for the cover is they were going to shoot a, a, a sheep on a couch in the Hawaiian surf. And they went all the way there and they did do that. And it was incredibly complicated. Especially had to sedate the sheep before they could even photograph it. And then they finished up using the picture three inches wide. This is so, so often absolutely happens. Absolutely insane. Well, it's like, um, you know, animals, the Pink Floyd one, which is, of course, Battersea Power Station. You know, they had, they had the pig, the inflatable pig. And, you know, the first one, broke free of its moorings and yeah. floated, <laughs> floated out. And um, I think they shot for three days there. Uh, and and they got the good sky on the first day, the good shot of the pig on the second day or something. And so they had to comp the two together, the two together. To, to make it work. And, of course, it is now inconceivable the, there was a world where if you wanted to have a picture of a pig suspended above Battersea Power Station... You actually physically had to get a pig. You had to pig get a pig. And fly and, it. And go to, go to the real Battersea Power Station. You know, whereas, you know, there are 14-year-olds down my street right now who can make that happen on their phone. Yeah, no, in about two with, minutes. With well, no trouble. McCartney, didn't McCartney want something shot on the top of Everest? Well, the McCartney thing was bizarre. McCartney had bought a Lalit, um statuette and, of course, millionaires buy stuff and get very attached to it. And so he wanted this to feature on the cover of Wings Greatest. And he wanted it to be taken to the highest mountain in the Alps, which I think was Mont Blanc. Yeah. And um, and I don't think they could do Mont Blanc, but they could do some other peak, which was equally impressive or whatever. And the only way you could get up it was you had, you had to go to a helicopter and, and kind of land on the glacier up there, you know. And, um, and they struggled, you know, to, to get this image of this statuette on the top of a mountain. And then finally took it back, showed it to McCartney. He said, "Well, yeah, it's great, but you could have done it in the studio." Yeah. Because, because that ever since everybody's That's done everything, the bill. <laughs> everybody, yeah. everybody does everything in the studio. Of course, they also supervise the cover of Band on the Band on the Run, don't they? That's what they did. Talk about only last week when which no one's really fully explained why they decided to do that. Actually, but it's it's a great cover. That's amazing. It is a great cover. Oh, it's a brilliant cover, and and we're still talking about it now. You know, yeah, no, such a clever idea. At the time, I remember thinking, looking at that for the first time, thinking that's Michael Parkinson. 
that's Kenny Lynch. Hang on, what's this? You know, they're all very well known, weren't they? Clement Freud. Yeah. But another one that interested me in the film was Atom Heart Mother, because again, it's that idea of complete randomness. I said, what's the idea for Atom Heart Mother? And one of them, I think Storm said, well, why don't we just put a cow on the cover? Yeah. And he said, okay, well, instead of going to a library and finding a cow picture and trying it out, he got in his car, didn't he? He drove outside of London. I'm going to tell you exactly where he went. Oh, go on. He went to Potter's Bar. Potter's Bar. Potter's okay. Bar, because he's, do you know why? Because his Probably. mother lived there. His mother no. lived there. No kidding. No. I, no. I, I well, know he everything. Went to Potter's Bar, right, I now know that. And there was a field full of cows. He got out of the car, wandered over, took about two or three pictures, got back in the car, went back to the studio. That was the album. No yeah. name of the band, no. no name of the album, just a picture of a cow. Yeah. And uh, I do love that idea that there was a time when all those things were possible. Absolutely, yeah. So, so what caused, what was the end of it for them? I mean, presumably the invention of CDs, wasn't it? I mean, when, 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 when albums sleep, and also punk rock to some extent. Um, and video. They, they, the company yeah. kind of broke up in the, in the early 80s, and it's the... Um, you know the the end of the of the era of the LP and uh, and the advent of the era of the promotional video. So they they shot loads of promotional videos, and uh, which is a very good way to lose a lot of money, I think. And um, they eventually did a, a disastrous film with Barry Gibb. Barry Gibb wanted to be a movie star, oh, and. They made some mad film, which didn't turn out very yeah. well. And they kind of, they, they had a falling out, you know, Storm and, uh, and Poe, and, um, and were only recon reconciled when, when Storm was nearly dead. And, uh, and so this whole story still goes back a long way, and it's extraordinary to think that these guys, you know, I, I was asked, uh, I was involved you know, in doing interviews and, and writing outlines for it. And, and I said, I said, the thing about this is it's, it's a story of a band, really. They're a band. They are a band, that's right. <laughs> and and they, they act like a band and they fall out. They're dependent on each other and then they fall out, don't they? And, and, and I, don't I, speak I, for 12 I'm years. I'm going to tell you, tell you one story that, that actually Poe told me while doing this. And it would have been in the film, but if they ever did a longer version, whatever. <laughs> and uh, which is that... Um, I don't know, it must have been 1920 or something like this. So this would be, when would this be? Um, late 60s. And, uh, you know, Storm was studying uh, at the Royal College of Art and Poe was not studying at the Royal College of Art but just used to go along, <laughs> just used to go to lectures and go and play in the, in the workshops and the labs and whatever, use the equipment, all this stuff leading a real kind of devil make care hippie lifestyle, which was which was subsidized or financed by passing dud checks. And these were in the days before bank cards, when you, you could go in a bank and say, could you cash me a check? Well, it was 40 pounds. How much would you like, sir? 50 pounds. Okay. And you would sign it and they, they would give you the money. And he did this all over London. And he eventually... Only once in the same bank each time. <laughs> yes, that's what we needed to do. Yeah. Until, inevitably, he got nicked, you know. Yes, he and, did. And he? so the full majesty of the law was bearing down on him, you know. His parents were tearing their hair out. Can you imagine this? Yeah. And he, yeah. He's going to go to prison and they're going to throw, throw away the key, you know. And he's going to be 20 years old and he's just, he's just kind of... He'd be chancer. He was just trying stuff because he can get away with it. And he told me that the person, the person that he has to thank for absolutely everything, who stepped in and I think mortgaged his house or something to pay his fine, was Pete Jenner. Pete Jenner, who at the time was manager of Pink Floyd, you know, and later on became manager of all sorts of people, Billy Bragg. All kinds of people over the years. Sweet natured bloke. Yeah, they were fantastic guy. You know, so people talk about managers as being figures with big skulls. Yeah, charlatans, rip off artists. <laughs> Policing the acts. It it's not yeah. often, you know, it doesn't work like that a lot of the time. So that, uh, you know, that um, Poe had, the, you know, there wasn't a day that went by following that that, that Poe didn't give thanks to Pete Jenner. I know. <laughs> for the, you know, 
he, he, he could have been all over, you know, the age of 21 or something. Absolutely. It's an mistaken. amazing story. And they were so productive. They just wrote these ideas all the time. There's a really interesting indication that they, they had this idea of, of the kind of Dali-esque concept of a man walking a lobster on a lead. Yeah, yeah, and they yeah, said yeah. they did that, I think, for 10cc, and 10cc didn't want it. And so then they offered it, offered it to Nazareth, and Nazareth didn't want it. So then he offered it to McCartney for wings, and McCartney said, fine, you know. I love the idea that that just proves that a lot of these things had nothing to do with the music at all. Oh, no, they were just an idea that just would get people's attention. It was a nice album. The nice, was it Elegy? I can't remember now. The one with Elegy. Just, the cover is just loads of coloured. Uh, balls in the middle of the Sahara. Actually, yeah. was the Sahara? They it went was. to the Sahara and filled it full of coloured balls. You know, <laughs> they Again. took balls to the Sahara. That's right, and that's you know that was far more interesting than the record inside by a long shot. Yeah. They're an amazing story. So that's on Netflix. Shall I tell you what I was watching last night on cool. the Disney Channel? I think for the second time. And boy, is it good. I don't know if you've ever seen it. The People versus O.J. Simpson. Yes, I have seen it. The five-part documentary it's made really by ESPN good. in the States about the O.J. Simpson case. I saw it years ago when it first came out. One of Stories. my abiding memories is of a helicopter shot following the car. Isn't that oh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when he's the the the, 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 the murder has happened and he's jumped into the car and he's driving, and then there's a news camera in a helicopter following down the freeway live, and they interrupt all these programs. It's amazing. But the whole thing, uh, and shall I tell you what conclusion I came to after watching the whole thing? This is possibly controversial, Mark, but hang on to your hat. I think he did it. <laughs> well, don't you remember the great Arma, Armando Iannucci gag? You must remember that. Oh, and what's that? Oh, it's just fantastic. Uh, O.J. Simpson came over to Britain. I don't know what he was promoting, but he'd come over to promote something or other and was walking around surrounded by journalists. And it was after this case, everybody thought that, you know, he must have been responsible. And Armando Iannucci had a little film crew with him and he's got a piece of paper and uh, and a pen, and he goes up to him, and it's folded over like this. And he goes up to O.J. Simpson on camera and says, "I'm just so thrilled to to see you, huge fan. Could you just quick tag get your signature?" And he signs O.J. Simpson, and he turns to the camera and opens it up, and it just says, "I did it." Signed O.J. Simpson. <laughs> it's just the simplest, most kind of schoolboyish gag, but it's just so funny. But it's amazing because this is now. It's nearly 30 years ago, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So if you watch it, you think that's the moment at which the world began to go mad, you know. And the internet hadn't even come along, really, at that point. You know what I mean? So 24-hour rolling news, you know, showbiz being more important than justice, what things look like being more important than you know what, what they actually added up to. Yeah. All that stuff goes back to there. And so if you watch it now, it's like watching the 1930s or something. You know, it's, it just seems incredibly distant, you know. But it's true. But, People were rigging each other up, weren't they, and saying there's a live stream showing this police car. Well, yeah, yeah, well, you had the yeah, you had twenty-four hour rolling rolling news, and of course, of course, the other thing is that the, the other thing which was a kind of straw in the wind is that the cameraman interviewed talking about that, or the helicopter pilot talking about that, is now a woman. Oh, so that was that's, all that's, the beginning. Yeah, that's interesting. Of something else, you know. Yeah. So. I cannot recommend it too highly um, to go and watch it. And, you know, as I say, I think he did it. And the other thing it, it makes you think is, well, obviously Trump's going to get away with absolutely everything because I have seen the American justice system and I've seen jury trial and I've seen how it works in the United States and there's no doubt about it. He will absolutely walk away from all those charges, no trouble at all. So what have you been watching on the television? Well, on the TV, um, 
thing called the Newsreader, which is quite good, an Australian uh, oh, right. series about set in a in a in a news uh, news um, a new TV newsroom, and that's pretty good. Although it rather overcooks the idea that people arrive just split seconds before they go on air. Yes, with kind of people <laughs> fighting to get their hair in place and uh, dabbing them with powder, and then they and then they compose themselves in point two of a second and go. And now this evening's news at six o'clock when so and so happens, you know. But it's that's good. Though just, I mean, I, I, to be absolutely broadly topical, last night I couldn't resist watching it for the what? It must be the fifteenth time. I don't know. Some like it hot, Dave. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's still an absolutely incredible film. Which is extraordinary? You, which bits did you laugh at? Did you I? Laugh? That's always my question. Some like it hot. Listen, it's Billy Wilder, who's a genius. And it's Jack Lemmon, it's Marilyn Monroe, it's all that stuff. It doesn't make me laugh. Oh, there's some good it lines in it. It, it. I know there are some great lines in it. it Tony, looks Tony, Tony Curtis's Cary Grant impersonation. Doesn't fantastic. make me laugh. Doesn't make me laugh. Doesn't make me laugh. Uh, the Billy Wilder film that I would that I'd recommend. Well, this some like it. It's wonderful. I'm sure. Uh, but the Billy Wilder film that is also on the on the BBC iPlayer at the moment, which I heartily recommend. Is Double Indemnity? Have you ever oh, seen yeah, that yeah. with Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck and uh, Edward G. Roberts? Film. Yeah, which is the ultimate kind of film noir. Uh, you know, I don't know, late forties. Is it? God, it's a great film. I I absolutely love that film. Um, but you know, I, I I just my only problem with some like it hot is it doesn't oh, actually it make me laugh. I was but, reading something about this morning. It was made in nineteen fifty nine, and that's at that point there was some kind of some kind of ruling for the uh, for the film studio that they weren't allowed to make films about cross dressing because it was going to be too confusing. For oh, the really? And he, Billy Wilder, just never bothered to tell them that this is what he was doing because he knew that they'd object and just went yeah. ahead and did it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good film. So, talking of television, Mark, I'm going to be on your television screen on Boxing Day evening in what I'm calling the Malcolm and Y slot, Mark. It is eight thirty. Boxing Day, I should be taking part I can't wait. in university. <laughs> this is so good. So this is, there are, I can't remember how many teams there are, about 10 or 12. And then you're, is it Middlesex University, your old college? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my old college got absorbed into Middlesex University. And, um, yeah, because they contacted me, I don't know, September or whatever. It's one of those emails you get, you know, oh, yeah, we're putting together, the, they, they do this. At Christmas, they have when these you mentioned alum- it to me, and I was incredibly enthusiastic because me and my wife are addicted to university shows. And I hadn't watched it. I hadn't watched it in years. I hadn't oh, watched it since the days of Bamba Gascoigne. And um, anyway, they said, you know, we we putting together an alum alumni specials, whatever. And w- would you like to be in the Middle Middlesex University team? And uh, <laughs> I, I told you, I told you and my wife. And you said, oh, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. And I said, oh, I'm not so sure. And, uh, you know, because what if it all goes wrong? You said, and then you said, yeah, you're right, actually. It might go wrong. Don't do it or whatever. Oh, did and I? Then, yeah, you did. Oh. And, and anyway, I kind of held off. I, I, I didn't, I neither confirmed nor denied. And but I was talking to my wife about it. He said, well, they're not going to ask you again. And I thought, that's a very good point. That's a good it? point. <laughs> that's a really good point. It is. And uh, so I eventually said yes, not never thinking it would happen, you know, because television, they, you know, there's a, there's a million slips between the first phone call that yeah, something actually happened. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, sure enough, it did happen. And it's a very odd thing because you can't prepare for it. You can't. No. You sit there on the train. I'm going on the train to Manchester to do the recording. I'm thinking, I ought to be limbering up here. Yeah, you think, well, maybe I'll get pre-Raphaelite poetry or uh, maybe I'll get uh, the work, early work of Brian Eno. But, you know, you just, what can you so do? You don't know. What are you going to do? You ask yourself questions that you know the answers to. Yeah. You know, that, that's not the point. And so you get that. My major learning about the whole thing, which I never knew, Mark, is every team has a reserve. They have a bench. With with somebody in a tracksuit on that bench, and, somebody and, who's who's getting almost as wound up as the people who are going to be on it for no reason at all. 
Well, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's, uh, and that must have been a thing that they decided to do years ago because they needed to. Because, yeah. and I don't know if it relates to the fact it's a very straightforward thing to record because. You know what you what you see is what you get. It's the game you play the game. You know as you see it on the telly. There's very little stopping or anything like that. But what they do say to you at the beginning: if any of you feel unwell in any way, don't worry. Just stop. Put your hand up, and we'll stop. Yeah. And they can only be saying that because it's happened. It, I was going to say it's not only happened, it must happen quite a lot. <laughs> Probably. People just think I'm just overloading with anxiety. Because nobody on a, on, a, on another television programme, they never say, they never say no. that to you on breakfast time. If you feel ill, put your hand up. Well, I know no, it's wouldn't. not recorded. But, you know, they don't say that to you on anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and so there must be many occasions when people just get overcome with anxiety or, or whatever or feel faint. <laughs> Or throw I'm not up. Surprise. Oh, whatever. Um, There's a lovely scene in the young ones. Do you remember that with the Toffs versus the Oiks or whatever it is? <laughs> it's so brilliant with uh, Emma Thompson and Stephen Fry up against uh, against Viv and uh, and and uh, Rick Mail. It's just brilliant. But what I'm looking for, Dave, is is the idea that my wife has this obsession with with the voice of Roger Tilling. Yes. If you look at the credits, it always says Universal Challenge presented by now it's Amal Rajan, who's really good, by the way. He is oh, very good. God, yeah. he's good. That program was always good. He is apps and he's so kind to the people who lose. Jeremy Paxman always just say, well. Well, uh, Sussex, you, you really disgraced yourselves and let yourselves down. He's always saying, you made such a good start, such a good stab. You've been such good contestants. But anyway, after that, it says, presented by it, so it says, with the voice of Roger Tiller, yeah, which Claire yeah. always thinks is uh, a brilliant name for a band that ought to be a band called that. But what I'm looking for is the voice of Roger Tiller go, going, Middlesex Hepworth, every time you open your mouth, which I hope is quite often. <laughs> Well, he does it live. He's there, he's there in the studio. Obviously, he's got to got to do it live. But it's such a well grooved procedure because you would expect the cameras to be moving about a lot for close ups and stuff. They're not at all. It's all just kind of locked off at one end of the studio. They know absolutely what they're doing because they've done that program, you know, a million times. When did it start? The early 60s. God's oh, God, I'm not even sure if it wasn't before that. It was Bam. No, it was It's been virtually in my, in my entire life it's been all of it. It's the early 60s. It's post-Coronation Street, but, you know, it's probably mid-60s or something that starts. And uh, and so, you know, you, you you feel you know it, you know. Even people who don't watch it. So I've, I've now got a picture of me and a University Challenge team with my little nameplate, you know, Hepworth and so forth. And because the kids look at it, and they just think it's hilarious. I know. It's, you know. it's like having a picture of you with a police mugshot or something yes, like that. It's, <laughs> it's such a such well known context, yeah. you know. Anyway, it's a so there it is. Timed. That's brilliant. Uh, well, we shall look after it. Boxing Day. Boxing You're Day and Boxing Day eight thirty. Don't miss it. This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. Okay, it's birthday corner. We're joined by. Patreon supporter and friend of the pod, John Innes. Hello, John. How are you doing? Hello. I'm very well, thank you. How are you both? Well, when, when, well, was, it when was the birthday? When was the uh, birthday? It was uh, last week. All right. Okay. So you're over it now. Yeah. So it's customary on these occasions for us to invite our birthday guests to throw a log on the conversational fire. And have you got one, John? I've, I've got a couple. So um, one of them tied into a gig that I was at recently, which was... Um, the bands that you like when you're a teenager because nobody else likes them. <laughs> you know, you kind of, you, you decide you're going to fixate on a band that will be yours and yours alone. Um, and my one when I was in school was was a sort of gothy band called Balaam and the Angel. Or Balaam. Oh, yeah. Balaam, Balaam, and the Angel. Balaam, Balaam, I remember Balaam that. and the Angel. Um, and I saw them in the Barrowlands in Glasgow last week. They were supporting a band called The Almighty. Um, and I went along, so I saw them for the very first time. Oh, so they really? Were my my sort of band when I was fifteen, and everybody hated them apart from <laughs> me. <laughs> Which is, is that, what made them attractive, of course. Yes. Mm. Exactly. You learned to draw the logo. You did things like that, and that was, you know, 
exciting when you were 15. They were an exercise book band, weren't they? You see, I think there's a whole there's a whole seam of teenage devotion to bands, which is all to do with what you can draw on your exercise yeah. book. You graduate from drawing, well, it's in my case because I'm old enough, you graduate from, from drawing Spitfires to drawing drum kits with logos on them, you know what I mean? And then Vox amplifiers. And then guitars, and so forth. that's right. <laughs> you can slowly do that stuff. I did exactly the same. And so I'm amazed it was, it's was. it been this long since you, you you never seen Balaam and the Angel yeah. before. They, 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 how were they? Uh, they were actually really good. Oh, they, right. um, they, they still had big hair and big glasses. They all dressed in black. They had, they had a sort of whiff. If you, if you were to visually describe them, I'd say they looked more like taxi drivers than yes. the rock gods. Yes. <laughs> but, but they were, were good. They were slightly goth back Gentlemen of a certain age. Goth. Gentlemen yeah. of a certain age all go through a stage where they look like taxi drivers. <laughs> yeah. They look like, no, more to the point, actually, they look like mini cab drivers. Yeah. That's a, yeah. It's a different yes. thing. It was definitely mini cab drivers. <laughs> mini cab drivers. The old joke Marco tells about you, you being at the festival down in the. Uh, West Country, when Van Morrison turned up at the door and somebody said, has anybody ordered the cab? Yeah, but Van Morrison in a flat cap and a sort of awful <laughs> belted jacket and a pair of very, 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 very decayed cords. Classic. Is so, anybody- John, what was your other your other thing? Was about, it was about uh, depictions of, of magazines in yes. film and television? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've got various sort of – there are things that take you out of the moment when you're watching a film. Um, one of those – for me, is uh, people drinking out of cups where there's obviously nothing in it. it oh, just, right. My eye goes to it. it um, you sort of. Comp- yeah, you can't stop moment. looking. Yeah. yeah. It's like suitcases which you've clearly got nothing in yes. them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, obviously you both worked in the world of magazines and journalism for many years. I still work in, in magazines and journalism. And, but anytime you see, a music magazine or any kind of journalism depicted in a film, it's always completely wrong. Utterly never, wrong. Never it's, even close to being... Hold the front page, people are saying. That's right. Yeah. No, but they, they, uh, the first thing that strikes you is whenever there's a magazine of any kind shown in a drama, they always have a really splendid office. And I've hardly ever been in the magazine that had a splendid office at all. And you've got a fabulous reception desk behind which... The latest cover is 10 miles high behind the fabulously gorgeous young receptionists and so forth. And the people running back and forth yeah. bears no resemblance whatsoever to any magazine office I've ever been in. The only one, and I've got an exception, purely because the magazine involved is also an exception, and that is The Devil Wears Prada, because that kind of is vogue. American Vogue. That's well, that's a ludicrous world. That's not like anybody else's world. Yeah. But it tells you a lot of truth about the way those magazines operate. Actually, about what they're all about. Um, and I, I, you know, I think I think that's uh, that's worth points. Actually. And a lot of it's about the photo shoots too, which is what of course all much that. of that magazine is about, rather than the, the in office life. The yeah. only other thing I would say is, is, and obviously it's fictitious, but it's meant to be Rolling Stone is almost famous. I think yeah, the character, it's obviously the Cameron Crowe character has having had experience as Dave has too of being on the road with bands and that yeah. terribly nervy thing of I can remember being on the road with Squeeze and Steel Pulse and all sorts of people of trying to crack this gang, trying to get these people who are absolutely cemented together and yeah. try and impress on them that you were a nice person, you wanted to be liked and you wanted to get some access to them. And I thought his kind of the way that he's in awe of the band. Stillwater, yeah. isn't he? Sitting there, holding his microphone out and picking up every pearl of wisdom, <laughs> which he will then dutifully transcribe. Well, that was really, really accurate, actually. Yeah. I, See, I, I think so, yeah. The one I, mean, I saw, the one I saw on. recently that, that, um, that, that was nothing like reality um, had the trope of the sort of plucky young sub-editor Right. Who, who has an own, their own personal story that they really want to follow. And, and they convince the editor to give them no, no more than six weeks to work on that one story. <laughs> and you just think, goodness, that's, that's never happened in the history of Absolutely. Germany. Well, it did at Rolling Stone. I mean, up till, you know, I can remember meeting people when I was at Q and they were still traveling for, for a month on the road with whoever it was in Europe to get their story. You'd think, how can that possibly be? 
affordable part well except else. it did make sense that if you were doing it with somebody who was a big star it was going to be on the cover because you were going to you know sell more mm. copies as a consequence of it but not not a kind of minor story i'll tell you the other thing that strikes me i i I, I ought to make a note of these things when they pop up on streaming television. I was watching something the other day, which were clearly supposed to be set in a magazine, but somebody had said, oh, you can't do magazines. They're passe or whatever. Let's make it a website. And I thought, this is even more ludicrous. That You've got a website that's got a fabulous office and a 10-mile high picture of, you know, uh, uh, of the website and a fabulous-looking receptionist. All those things, you know, websites are done by people in their pajamas, lying in bed, aren't they? Basically, that, yeah. that that's how it works. You in know. separate rooms, exactly. <laughs> they never meet. Actually, they, they at least the whole, whole idea of an office is you've got that kind of camaraderie and the yeah. gang together. You know. Although I have to tell you, somebody got in touch with me recently that I know, who's being asked to research the background for a potential drama set in the world of a pop magazine in the early 80s. Now imagine what that might turn out to be. They got in touch with me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there, you, there you are. I know. You know. Watch out. You know, this may all get, um, may all get corrected very soon. And uh, going back to your first point about your, uh, about Balaam and the Angel and so forth. In my day, back in the 60s, you used to go and buy a knapsack from the Army and Navy store to take your books to school. And you used to have to scrawl in biro mm. on the back of that thing, your favourites. And so everybody used to do, I don't know, the Beatles and the Stones or whatever. But then they all also had a kind of supporting bill of, of acts in descending obscurity that they, they happened to like. And I well remember mine used to say, Beatles, Stones, or whatever, I don't know, the animals, Bob Dylan. And at the bottom it would say, really, really tiny. So you had to get really close to read it. It would say the Mark Lehman Five. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. This, I used to be a fan of the Mark Lehman Five. I'd seen them twice. And uh, they never came to anything. But, you know, they're, 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 that's very much a teenage boy's thing, isn't it? To have something that nobody else can get. Did uh, Did you go and see the... The McCartney photograph exhibition. Yeah, we went together. Yeah, there's a there's an exercise book, and I can't I can't remember who it's by, but where one of them has has created Beatles logos. Oh, really? And there's a sort of one where there's a sort of double B made to look like a beetle. Oh, and it goodness. must. Have, I don't know if it's Paul McCartney or John Lennon, but it was just a page of doodles oh. logo. Oh, it all it all starts with with a doodle doesn't it you know, <laughs> it, it all starts with a there's doodle. a little doodle for i think the cover of sergeant pepper by mccartney and for the crossing of abbey road too i think that i think i've right in saying i've seen little pictures of those oh yeah so but he, he was quite good yeah yeah, yeah. He certainly sketched those I think. yeah yeah great future in an advertising agency if, if the pop game goes wrong well john thanks very much for joining us lovely and, to see you. um you know, enjoy the rest of your birthday week. I'm sure. I'm sure everybody else is. You know, is recognising this, and there's probably flags out in the street and uh, <laughs> small children walking Bunting, around. Bunting, bonfires, Bunting, yes, street parties. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Your bands. Thanks very much for your continued support, John. The Word Podcast, walking the digital dog since 2007. So, readers' letters, Mark. Readers' letters. This one comes from Bob Baird, um, and Bob's been listening to the podcast ever since back in the day, and he points out how some of the early ones, uh, like, a, like, like a history lesson almost, he heard the one where I apparently mentioned uh, Twitter for the first time <laughs> with some surprise, you know. And um, I, It would I'd be love really to... good to find that, wouldn't it? If we it could would. find it, Bob, if you're listening and you know which one it was, let us know. Because it'd be really nice to dig that out. Because I, I think those things are extraordinary. I can still remember the first email I sent to Dave saying, I've I've got an email. My <laughs> email's working. It's absolutely amazing. And your response, which was, don't throw away your, your tin cans and your string. It might not take off. You're only uh, joshing. But, uh, yeah. But it'd be good to hear that. No, it'd be good to hear that. And Bob also says that he, he likes listening to the earlier ones because he very much likes the kind of camaraderie between us and Kate and Jude and Andrew and Fraser and all sorts of people. And he wanted to know if we knew what was happening to them nowadays. 
course, we don't know because we don't speak to them anymore. <laughs> Well, we speak, we speak to them all the time, of course we do. don't we? And Rob Fitzpatrick was on the on the pod only last week. Fraser Lurie lives in New Zealand, and he's still uh, we saw him in the summer, didn't we? When he was over, and he still uh, edits the Classic Rock uh, website and does all that. And and Jude, we had on recently too, has a book out, doesn't she? And works for she Guardian, does. and has a very very good podcast called Songbook for her publishers as well. And Kate Mossman, we can even tell you, I can tell you what she's, she's doing right now. She's moving house. She's probably lifting a tea chest out the back of a, <laughs> of a van somewhere. She's moving house today. But Kate more and more usually uh, works for the New Statesman. And, uh, and Andrew, Andrew Housen has a very thriving company producing all kinds of podcasts, very often current affairs, political podcasts. Doing, doing very well. Mike Seventies Johnson. Who we saw only last week. He came to one of our um, things at 21 Soho, didn't we? Still looks exactly worked. the same. It's called Seventies Johnson because he looked like a kind of early member of Little Feet or something, didn't he? He, he, looked, with he looked, looked like he ought to be in James Taylor's backing band. Yeah, 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 Playing the bass in James Taylor's backing band. So, yeah, we do see them all and we will pass on your good wishes. Uh, we've also... In legal corner from Mark Wils- Wilkins, who's a regular listener, but also a music business lawyer, was uh, interested in the story we were telling last week about um, Harold Wilson uh, taking legal action against the move in 1967 over a, a, a disrespectful postcard featuring him in flagrante with his then political secretary, Mar- Marcia Williams. And about how all the proceeds of the record Flowers in the Rain go to Harold Wilson's charities in perpetuity. Mark reckons you can't do this entirely in perpetuity because obviously copyright expires 70 years after the death of the composer, I think, or the last of the composers. I think it may be 50 years after the, after the last person on the record, something like this. It's more complicated than that. But he also points out that the one case where something does benefit uh, a charity in perpetuity, thanks to Parliament, is an exception was granted in the case of Peter Pan, Jerry Barry's, Barry's Peter Pan, because all, all the money goes in perpetuity to the Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is... That's a lovely point. thought, isn't it? Good to know. Guy Brasher, we're talking about elderly people who kept on going, keep on keeping on, member of Sun Ra's orchestra who's 99. 99 years old. And still performing. I love that. Uh, Willie Nelson, 90, and still got a full date book <laughs> in, in the next year. He says, is there a shout-out for Dominic Chianese? Chianese, however you pronounce it. Actor who plays Uncle Junior in The Sopranos, Johnny Ola in The Godfather Part 2. Also a singer... And uh, he's he's turning ninety three in February, but he's playing Egham next month. I absolutely Egham. love the idea. Ninety three year old, he'll be he'll be humping a bass amp up the stairs, absolutely. doing all that stuff. Absolutely good work. This podcast was brought to you by the Word. <laughs>